Hey everybody, I'm Michael Koval Anderson, urban designer, author, and host of the TV documentary series about urbanism, The Life Size City. Welcome to the YouTube channel for the series, or welcome back. Today, I'm going to revisit something that I started a few months ago, and we're going to tackle a little bit more five-minute urbanism today. But first, man, I've been doing a little bit of thinking. For millennia, beautiful humans have gathered together in cities, thriving and striving and struggling together, enduring and enjoying, sharing the warmth of a tight-knit urban fabric. Now, generally, I get out of bed every single day of the week as an optimist. I believe in change, I have contributed to it myself, and I see it happening all over the world. But then sometimes, man, when I have to look at streets or intersections like the one we're going to see in a minute, I just realize I'm only human, man. I get depressed. It really just bums me out. A once thriving street struggles to survive, to revive. And what stands in the way in cities all over the world? Oh, something as clumsy and mechanical as traffic engineering. Or rather, the people who continue to put their money on this one tired, sad, lame horse, failing to understand the beauty and the poetry of everything urban. Accepting mathematical models from like the last century ahead of not only health and safety and modernization, but the inherent potential goodness of a street, a neighborhood, a community, and of our cities themselves. Beauty and urban poetry, man, they don't mix very well with engineering at all. Prove me wrong. But sure, we need both. But where do we start? I just firmly believe that for years, decades, time and time again, we have been putting all the focus in completely the wrong place. I just needed to get that off my chest. Right, today, five minute urbanism, we're going down under. We're going to Melbourne. A subscriber here on the channel sent me a Google Maps link to the Fitzroy neighborhood, to Brunswick Street. Now, I have lived in Melbourne on two separate occasions back in the day, and I have visited since. So I actually know this street, and I know the local context. There are also other streets in Melbourne very similar to Brunswick Street, and they're all suffering the same fate. Here is a screen grab from Google Maps, which kind of tells us everything we need to know. Now, the guy who sent me this location also included in the email um, what the city keeps telling the people of this neighborhood. And it's the same kind of rhetoric we hear in so many places around the world. Oh, they're saying, you know what? Yeah, we can't remove all the on-street car parking because, you know, that would kill off the local businesses. <laughs> And they're also saying that, uh, yeah, we can't move the car parking that is on the street to the first five or ten parking bays on all the side streets because people need to park in front of a shop to pop in and make a purchase. Seriously, like they say that. <laughs> oh, FML. I'm going to get back to that later on, why that is completely untrue and quite ridiculous. But yeah, I found this uh, screen grab online from some website about you know, streets in Melbourne. And look at all of those cafes and restaurants. I didn't calculate the total capacity of those places, but it's easily over 100 people enjoying the street life and the local businesses. And then out front, proudly displayed, just six parked cars, six single occupant vehicles doing absolutely nothing, taking up valuable urban space, but also creating a visual wall between these shops these restaurants and the sidewalk and the street and the urban fabric. The focus here is clearly so last century. The focus is on, oh, how do they get to this place and not at all on the place itself. First of all, I have a couple of screen grabs from uh, street viewing myself up and down this street. Is that a bike lane or is it parking? Somebody make a decision. It really looks like they want it to be parking and bikes have just been sort of squeezed in randomly along this street. Look at that little restaurant there. Yeah, it looks like a Thai restaurant. They so desperately want to have outdoor serving. They got a couple of tables out there, a little, ooh, a little fence as well. Health and safety regulations in Australia are off the charts. But they're trying to have a little bit of street life. But who wants to sit and stare out at that street while they're eating their Thai food with all of that traffic? Not attractive at all. And then this is what it's like a little bit of farther along. You have this bike lane, you know. Oh, it's on the wrong side of parked cars. It's not parallel to the curb. It's in between the door zone and moving traffic. And then a little bit farther along in the street view, it just disappears. 
it's gone. Hilariously, this street is actually marked on the cycling map of Melbourne. Yeah, just go and ride your bike there. We've created a bicycle route for you. You know what? The first solution here is really find out whoever proposed this solution, whoever thought it up, drew it up, took it to a meeting to propose it to the team, eh, and just fire them. You know, or send them somewhere else. Send them out to build highways out in the, out in the desert or something. But man, and whoever approved the idea, let's remember that as well. There's somebody who actually looked at this and went, oh yeah, mate, that's a great idea. Now we're all bicycle friendly on Brunswick Street. Just get rid of the people who are responsible for this. Now, when I lived in Melbourne in the early 90s, I can tell you they were so proud of their tram network. There was this amazing civic pride about it. One of the great tram cities in the world. I've been back since and I can tell you it's a little bit different now because the trams are constantly stuck in car traffic. <laughs> There's a bit of a pro tip about trams right there. Um, trams should not be stuck in car traffic. It defeats the purpose of trams. When I was street viewing myself up and down Brunswick Street and the surrounding areas, I realized that it was really hard for me to actually find a tram in the street view shots. Now, if you drop yourself into street view into one of the other tram cities in the world, I don't know, Bordeaux, Strasbourg, uh, Antwerp, even Amsterdam, the odds of you finding a tram are pretty high. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to test that really, really quick. Okay, so I went to Strasbourg and I randomly zoomed in on what I assume is the city center and uh, had a look around for a tram symbol marked on the map. And I think I'm just going to grab that little yellow man and drop him randomly onto a tram spot or a tram line. And yeah, <laughs> okay, sorry. That was a bit easy. That was not planned at all. I promise. And then I went over to Bordeaux. There's a city zoom randomly in on the city center. Again, looking for a tram symbol, did the same thing. Grab the little yellow man, slap him down there. See what happens. All right, cool, tram line. And <laughs> okay, man, really? So let's go out again and just find another street. Ah, there's one, okay. Grab the yellow man, dump him down on the street. And now oh, there's a tram stop, cool. All right, there's no tram. Oh wait, no, there's a tram up there. Wait, let's go see. Yeah, okay, I can't actually catch the tram. It's gotta be there, there it is, yeah. Up by the tram stop there. Yeah, okay, see, I mean, when trams aren't stuck in car traffic, it's funny how you can't actually catch them because they're an effective transport form. But when you zoom into Brunswick Street, you know, in Melbourne generally, the trams are few and far between. Like, how about increasing the frequency and making it a competitive transport form like it was for decades in this city? And looking at Brunswick Street, I realized, you know what? It doesn't look like there are seriously marked crosswalks. Long blocks with no intuitive safe way to cross. Man, that sucks for the local businesses and safety and the urban fabric and you name it. Oh, there you go. There's a tram. Now, there's one thing that I'm wondering looking at these street view shots, and that is how many of these motorists are what Italian traffic planners quite literally call parasites. Motorists who just drive on through, exploiting the host organism, feeding off the street, the neighborhood, and in this case, the tram tracks without contributing anything to it at all. Just constantly keeping it in a state of illness and eventually slowly killing it off. I have, surprise, surprise, an article that I have written about parasites down in the description. Generally, my impression is that this street is just way too busy. There are too many options for the width of the street and for the context of the neighborhood. You got trams, bikes, pedestrians, car traffic, car parking. Something has to give if we're going to try and fix this street. It's a no-brainer. There's just not enough room for all of these different transport forms. But yeah, let's do this. Let's start the clock. I literally see two feasible options. Now for this one, I decided to use a tool that I developed with a couple of friends of mine for a website called Kid Sized Cities. It's an interactive feature uh, for urban planning for kids. Uh, I'm going to link to it down in the description. You can have a look at it, play with it yourself if you like. But really, this is child's play, so this is kind of appropriate to use this interactive tool. So let's do that. The two solutions that I got in mind for this street, the first one's pretty easy. I'm going to click over here on bikes. I'm going to uh, Add, drag it in there, a protected bike lane. And yeah, we're going all the way down with that. Put it here on the other side as well. Drag it along there. Boom. There you have it. We're creating a nice buffer between the sidewalk and 
the roadway with protected bike lanes. For the purpose of this first solution, I think we're just going to let the cars do what they're doing now, uh, you know, being the parasites that they are, these motorists driving down the tramway. Add some bike racks there like that, maybe some over here as well, and access to the shops for a lot more citizens with money to spend. Add some benches there. You know, we can go crazy with trees and stuff like that. And you're going to see a lot more people walking on this street because we're going to calm it down and make it much nicer. Okay, so for the second solution I got in my brain for this street, I reset it so that it looks like Brunswick Street today. And I kept those bike racks there because uh, we're, we're going to use those on this solution as well. Now for this one, I'm thinking we could just take this sidewalk and extend it. If this is an important street in this neighborhood and a designated shopping street, which it is apparently in Melbourne, I don't know what that means. It sounds like weird zoning, but yeah, it's a nice street and it needs to be better. Let's just extend the sidewalks and uh, maybe move those bike racks actually a little bit closer to the curb out there. Like that. Oh, that way, of course. And maybe there we'll just keep two bike racks. But for the street, this is what we're going to do right there. Boom, drag it along like that. Adding bicycle infrastructure on the tram tracks. Now, now I'm, I'm not normally a fan of, I don't normally recommend professionally uh, bikes and buses sharing a lane. It just simply doesn't work in most cities in the world because buses move quite quickly and the stops are quite far apart. There are some cities in the world where I've seen it kind of work. Paris is one of them. It's simply because buses on some of their routes, man, they stop incredibly frequently. And you never really feel like a bus is, you know, trying to hunt you down. So on a high density bus route, for example, I can live with that. Here as well, if we're going to remove all of the cars on this street, uh, the motors will have to find some other routes. We're going to create a pretty decent bicycle route as well. And again, we can work with the tram stops uh, and, and design those accordingly. Now, bicycles and trams have coexisted for more than a century. Of course, it's never 100% optimal with tram tracks, but it works in so many cities, especially here in Europe. While we're at it, if we're extending those sidewalks, you look at on that street view, there are no trees, no foliage whatsoever. Once you do this, you're just going to massively increase the number of people who are using this street. You're going to create a destination that people want to go to, want to spend time at, uh, a sticky destination as it were, and you're going to get some outdoor seating as well. Put in some benches there. People can look out at the street. You can add some cafe area, you name it. Everything is going to be amazing. That's the second solution. Okay, I think that might be it. Not that hard at all. So what would actually happen if we implemented one of these two solutions on Brunswick Street or any other street really like it in the world? We, it would have an amazing and almost instant impact. First of all, we would massively improve the volume of traffic down this street. Trams are great when they're frequent, right? They can carry a lot of people back and forth and across the urban landscape. but. Bicycle infrastructure, best practice, 2.5 meters wide, one way, both sides of the street. We know that that can move 5,900 people per hour. Instead of just the 1,300 uh, people per hour that a car lane can move, and then you have just these stationary vehicles in this car storage slash parking that have absolutely no function whatsoever, taking up valuable urban space. We also know that bicycle infrastructure like this, it, it calms down the street, it improves the profit margins of the shops and restaurants as well. All the studies that I've seen, and they've been studying this for 40 years all over Europe, and now we're seeing it in other parts of the world, profit increase of between 40 and 60%. If you love your local businesses, if you want them to prosper and thrive and contribute to the neighborhood and the city at large, you put in bicycle infrastructure and you do it as soon as possible. This is an amazing business model for a street. Here in Copenhagen, we love to measure things. We measure the hell out of everything. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that 
the, the cyclists in this city, they contribute just as much as the motorists in supermarkets and street level shops. Massive amount of money to be made. We also know that cyclists, people who just ride bikes for transport and ride them around their neighborhoods, they actually spend more money than motorists do. On average here in Europe, 100 euros more per month. Now with the population density in this part of Melbourne, I think it's at 7,400 people per square kilometer. Man, that is a great start. I can tell you that if this street was in Copenhagen in a neighborhood like this, there would be, and I can guarantee it, 10 to 15,000 cyclists a day up and down this stretch. This presupposes, of course, that there is a cohesive, intelligent, connected network of safe bicycle infrastructure across the city, but there is massive potential. We know that when people on bikes are cycling past, they're doing some shopping. They're riding at a speed that is conducive to having a look around. You can also do it on trams. And when you have people park on the side streets and force them to force them, like it's a real chore to walk 100 meters, right? But yeah, force them to walk down to the shop. They're walking past five other shops and they're seeing things they would not see if they just drove past at 40, 50 kilometers per hour. This would drive a massive number of people through this neighborhood, up and down this street. And these people would actually stop, unlike the parasites. Wider sidewalks are conducive to street life and amazing for local businesses who can put out more outdoor serving. Removing the on-street car parking will simply create a nicer street, a nicer destination. It'll slow down to something pleasant and prosperous. It really just boggles the mind how we have to continue having this conversation. We know all of these things. They're happening in cities around the world. They've been in place in cities around the world for decades. And you know, the times I've been in Australia over the past decade, uh, I just really am stunned at how far behind they are in this conversation. <laughs> when you have American cities that are ahead of you, sometimes even light years ahead of you in matters regarding urbanism, ooh, Australia, it's getting embarrassing. But you don't even have to take my word for it if you don't want to, because you know what? There are visionary and passionate activists in Melbourne, and they are doing all of the hard work that the city should be doing themselves. They are looking around the world for solutions that would fit into Melbourne, solutions that have the all-important transferability. Copy-paste, Control-C, Control-V. They do amazing renderings, showing you like, in no uncertain terms what the street would look like with some simple urban fixes. And I'm going to link to a website down below where you can see their hard work and maybe it will work in whatever city you happen to be in as well. We have to visualize the future. We have to do it especially when the city can't be bothered. Stuck in their last century mentality, unable to move forward into the new millennium. And that my friends is me for today. Thanks for watching this little five minute urbanism session. Please like this video, unless you're from the city of Melbourne or one of the boroughs down there, then you probably won't be hitting like anytime soon, I guess. But hey, suck it up, buttercup, and the future is now, right? Please subscribe to the channel. We've got lots of cool stuff going on, and we're going to be making more of it. That's it. Michael Koval-Anderson, out. See you next time.